Didn't the other kids tell you not to come here? Go back, 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 go back. At the heart of horror, there has always been more than spooks and scares. Sometimes, it's not what you see, but what you hear. Welcome to Sound Scary. Each week, we talk to the artists, the musicians, the fans, the people who haunt the shadowy corners of your mind. Join us as we delve into the deepest, darkest, and most unforgettable earscapes. Welcome to Sound, Sound Scary. Scary. Uh, welcome to another episode of Sound Scary Quarantine Edition. I'm your host Ryan Coltrera, and I am James Oster. And look, I, I we're we're in season two now. We're really into the show. We're really happy. We've got the best guest, and today is probably one of my favorite guys in the world, uh, Jimmy Duval. Can I call you Jimmy for the show, Jimmy? Please, Can I please do, you, Jimmy. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's, it's good, good to see, see, you, again. see you again. Thanks it's for having, having me. me, dude. It's so, great. Thanks, 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 Jimmy, for having me. me. Yeah, no, honestly, man, it's been a while. I think the last time I saw you was at Amoeba, when we could actually when get it was open, open. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> Far one out for Amoeba. It was open. Yeah, we'll go back, man. We'll go back. It's coming back. It's got to come back. Yeah, you know. Well, you know, they moved it, and they're about to open it at the new location. Then we went into this new kind of second, like curfew lockdown. So it'll probably be early next year. I'm gonna assume. I work right around the corner from the new Amoeba, and I've just been looking through those windows and drooling like I'm in a Charles Dickens orphanage, and oh, someone's got a bowl of porridge. Literally thinking about it last night. I'm like, <laughs> I wonder what new stuff they've been able to stock up that no one's been able to snag. Know. When they right? open up, what's I'm gonna excited. be? Because when they opened up the first time, I waited in line. It was a long line back in like 2002 or 2003 in LA. And I couldn't believe, you know, for me, it was like a dream come true. Cause I used to actually do road trips up to the Bay area, literally just to go to the one on Telegraph, the original one. Yeah. And then they opened a second one in hate street in the nineties. And I was like, what are you kidding? There's two of them. And then all of a sudden I'm driving down Sunset Boulevard one day. I'm like, Amoeba in LA, you're killing me. You're killing me! <laughs> How often do you go to see the shows and the live shows that that, are, that play there, dude? Uh, it's ever since they've been having them. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. My, I, I took my son to see. I don't know if you remember this. If you're there for Glenn Hanser, do you remember that one when they he played with uh, the girl from Once? And yeah, I, oh man, they've had so many people at that place. It's kind oh of been really unbelievable. Yeah, I've seen a lot yeah. of my favorite artists for free. I couldn't get tickets to their shows. I know. So they go play to the live yeah. show to me. You line up, you get in, you're like, "This is amazing! I didn't have to pay." I I'm going to get my CD autographed after the show. Awesome! Oh man, I miss it. I mean, Wait, I I gotta ask, who's your favorite uh, the favorite show? Like, can you name like two, three favorite shows that you've seen at Amoeba that really mm. stuck out with you? Love and Rockets was really amazing there. Oh they did my like God. a reunion show there that was nice. super awesome. Um, big fans, and through the years, I've been actually you know fortunate enough to make acquaintances, kind of friends with Kevin and Kevin Haskins or David J and oh wow Peter a little bit, and used to play soccer with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So, right yeah, being a huge fan and then watching him come back and then going to the show, it was mind-blowing. Because I was at the very last Love and Rockets, the last one at the Roxy, which I want to say is like the late 90s. Oh, wow. You know, wow. but of course, like Bauhaus, they're like, you know, if it's not dead, it's coming back. Absolutely. Actually, I should say, even if it's dead with Bauhaus, it's coming back. <laughs> well, especially if it's dead with Bauhaus. It's yeah, coming that's back. the only thing yeah. that comes back. <laughs> No, I'm going to get into your career a little bit because uh, the first time I saw you, well before I knew you in person, I was at a midnight screening of the Doom Generation. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a crazy one. Yes, nice. that is. And now, what what was that like kind of coming up in Hollywood, working with Greg? And you worked with him a few times. You still recently, too. What was it like yeah. kind of finding that connection? Well, you know, it was kind of like, we met in a cafe way back when I was 18 as 
And so, yeah, it's very, friend like, we're like friends. And we're, even though when I met him, it was on a professional level. It, you know, I'd come to Hollywood. I grew up in LA. I'm from Detroit, but I grew up in LA. And uh, I started coming to Hollywood when I was about 15, 16, ditching school and catching a ride with friends and going to the record shops. And then after 16, 17, you know, I was legal, legal enough to drive um, and work. So I would take my bi-monthly paychecks and I would go over to Hollywood and I would spend 100, 150 bucks on music or whatever at the info stores. I think back then it was like Bleaker Bobs and Vinyl Fetish. Aaron's Records, which used to be on Melrose before it was on Highland. So that's what really, it was music that brought me into Hollywood. And then I made some friends coming out all the time on the weekends and I really liked it out, out there. So I, we're out here where I'm living. I should, I guess I'm still here. But uh, I ended up moving and within a couple of months of living here while I was out looking for a job, I used to see Gregor Rocky in this little cafe I used to drink coffee at. And that's the first place I used to hang out when I used to record shop, because that's the first place that I met girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a good place to meet Fair girls. Fair enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, out and drink the coffee, like, hey, how you doing? You're drinking coffee, me too, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, Greg, Greg Rocky was in there, and he was in there, you know, and I'd seen him over the course of a couple months, and I just used to see him riding, and I'm like, wow, that's so cool. Look at this, like you can have, and I thought he was my age at the time, some kid. You know, and I was 18, so I was like, that's cool. You can have some kid who's in here studying and doing his homework all the time. And, you know, he's getting ready to go off and, you know, get his diploma or degree or whatever. And here I am just loitering, drinking coffee, looking for a job. And we can cohabitate the same place peacefully. This is awesome. I like Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I do, too. I do, yeah, too. And it, yeah. And then one day he just came up to me and he was just like, hey, uh, I make these little no budget films and uh, you have a really interesting look and I'm making, getting ready to shoot another movie right now. And I don't know if you're an actor, if you'd be interested in auditioning for my movie. Yeah, and then it's kind of just like look around and be like, yeah, I'm an actor. Nice. Yeah, I'm an actor. Nice. I'll audition for your movie. So I auditioned for his movie and then I got it. Wow. Yeah, and that was kind of the beginning of everything that and. It was that first movie that after we'd finished that, he was writing another movie called The Doom Generation. And he kind of like made the character Jordan for me. It was an impression of who I was when he met me at 18, innocent and wide-eyed and like a lamb ready for the slaughter, just right to be like kicked apart limb by limb. <laughs> <laughs> Well, can I say, and in, 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 in all honesty, uh, you know, looking at you now, you look better, dude. You look freaking the same. How do you do that? <laughs> what is your secrets? Wait. Well, yeah, no, it was, I don't know if you saw me doing this earlier. It was like trying to adjust the lighting. Oh, okay. Like, there you go. It looks really good in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're killing it, man. Yeah, I guess oh, I just cut my hair. I Well, actually, my hair, this is my hair grown out. I'd done another project, and they shaved all my hair off. So I had no hair last oh, year. And then it started to grow out, and I got a little frustrated because I was just growing it out again. And then they shaved it for a pickup. Mm. Now I'm just sitting around going, man, I need a haircut. Like, this is like, this won't <laughs> look like shit. It hasn't been so easy. I mean, I guess we're back in kind of a quarantine here, limited. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's yeah. Time to back get those, to a little... those quarantine hair back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was actually hoping you'd have the long hair because then we'd Jimmy <laughs> squared with the long hair. I mean, it would be. Yeah, I mean, I I do miss the hair. There's still times, you know, you reach back for it and it's not there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I cut it a couple years ago. Just it was for work, really. Oh well, we were talking kind of about the the early stages of your career, and I kind of wanted to double down on that and ask, kind of growing up, uh, what films influenced you and kind of inspired your uh, career choice in entertainment? Well, it's crazy. I mean, for me, when, you know, which is tied into the conventions, believe it or not, and the autograph shows is like, when I was growing up, which was the 70s and 80s, like my formative years, all that stuff was like Halloween in the fog. I mean, before the second ones ever came out, you know, so it was horror at its really at its finest in the sense that besides Black Christmas, which had come out a few years before, which I hadn't seen yet, it was a whole new genre of film that didn't really exist on that level before. So it was very impactful to me at a very young age. But not, and it wasn't just horror, you know, it was the same thing. It's like, we grew up in the generation where we had in the same decade, we had Halloween, Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 
The Godfather. Jaws. Jaws. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I was trying to think of like Panic in Eagle Park and like uh, 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 there's so many Al Pacino movies, you know, that came out at the same time. Oh God, Serpico, Cruising. Oh my I mean, God. And I shouldn't even say, around, you know, it was just, it was a golden time for filmmaking in the 80s too. I mean, mm -hmm. I was still a kid and, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you go back and some of it's a little bit dated, but the storytelling is so right on and it's still there. And yeah. So for me, I was like, it was all, it was all the things that now that we see come to the forefront of genre and film. And like, I couldn't be, you know, I was saying to someone else the other day, I'm like, it's weird. I, if you would have told me when I was a kid that we'd have Star Trek on Thursdays, Star Wars on freaking Fridays, and then the Expanse, you know, as for the sci-fi fan, and then the Expanse coming in a couple weeks after that. So we're gonna have those three shows on at one time. Then, as a kid, you had to wait like every two years to get something that good, and it didn't go on week for week. No, no, and, and that's you know, and that's just a splash in the bucket. Then you have the fantasy shows and the horror shows. I mean, when did you ever think you would get like an Ash show with Bruce Campbell? That was insane. No. So <laughs> good. You watch these genres come to the <laughs> forefront. It really is all this stuff today. It was the basic building blocks of this that I was raised on, that I was inspired by. Mm -hmm. Even though I was watching the James Bonds on TV, like the first James Bonds I saw as a kid were the Roger, you know, I saw For Your Eyes Only in the theater. Nice. You know, I saw the Spy Who Loved Me in the theater. I saw uh, a View to a Kill in the theater, Octopussy in the theater. From then on, like everything in the theater. So watching those things in a big theater experience is also, you know, I think extremely, for me, inspirational. Going into this room that you watch the screens, 80 feet high actually to put it a little bit more simple what i used to say about it is it's amazing i know so many people that can't you know they talk about acting or in real life crying or being emotional but notice that when you're in a theater if you're watching a movie you can sit with 500 strangers and freaking lose it and you're not thinking they're watching me i mean you get lost in the story in the emotion the heart of the story and that's the magic of filmmaking just using crying as an example, but the same thing with laughing. It's the same thing when you watch something and you dream of being that superhero or that super villain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever it is, but that yeah. thing that you identify with that takes you out of that seat and you're literally transported into another place in another time into somewhere else, someone else and somewhere else. And that's magical. Man, yeah. you're making me miss theaters so hard right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, I haven't been to the, here's the thing, I haven't been to the theaters in 2020. I never what? went early I mean, on. Not at all? Yeah. No, I was like, oh, I'll go catch up. Because I had such a busy year last year, I was really burnt out at the beginning of the year. Yeah. You know, I had like maybe a month and a half off after working for four or five months, which is, and three of it was like a really hellacious shoot in Skull Valley in Utah, which was an 80 mile mm. drive every day from Salt oh, wow. Lake. Oh my yeah. God. And I'd already finished another movie where I had not been home, you know, for the entire film. And then I left town came back and as I was starting to recover, went to go shoot the pi this pilot in Buffalo and then the quarantine hit. Because mm. I remember in Buffalo, it was the end of February. I'm like, am I gonna get sick on this? Am, someone gonna, am I gonna get someone sick? And then you get home and yeah, it was, a, it was freaky. It's, this thing's been a little, you know, I've been handling it well and I'm healthy, but it was a little, I was a little more freaked out in the beginning than I am now, even mm. though everything's exploding. Yeah. Only because for those of us who don't believe in conspiracy theories, who do listen to the scientists, this is what they said would happen. And yeah. I did a lot of homework through this. Uh, and if you look up the Spanish flu and the Spanish, you know, the Spanish flu and the original pandemic a hundred years ago, you see the people saying the same things yeah. with the same complaints. Like literally a hundred years ago during 1918, they're like, you're taking, you're stopping on my constitutional rights. I'm not wearing a mask. They uh, said this. Mm -hmm. shit. Can I say that in 1918? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, they fucking say whatever you want. No one wanted to listen. And there's a famous story between St. Louis and Philadelphia. And this was after the first wave. Mm -hmm. And there were three waves of the Spanish flu, each deadlier than the next. And after the first wave, they had, we're going to have a parade. The disease is over. And in <laughs> Philadelphia, they got the, led by the priest, he's like, I'm going to take the mask off. Let's all take our mask off together. In the middle of the parade. And at the same time, St. Louis is like, eh, yeah, you know what? We're not going to have a parade. So there was massive outbreaks in both places, but nothing that happened in St. Louis compared to everybody who showed up by the tens of thousands for a parade and took their masks off and spread that Spanish flu and tens of thousands died from that. And you watch this on television and you can see it coming and they're like, everything's delayed two months. And 
I mean, it's just, if anything, you know, and I'm not, I'm not on a side and I'm not one to really like, I'm a part of this like we all are. Yeah. But you know, people need to, take, they need to pay a lot more attention to being well informed and not following these conspiracy theories. And we wouldn't oh, sure. have these explosions that we do. Not in the same way anyway. It would yeah. still explode. Europe's still exploding. But yeah. that being said, look at Germany. They're having these protests. I don't want to wear a mask. And then everyone gets sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it will <laughs> It will end. We will get a vaccine and we'll let the yeah. other we'll subject get there. first. And when they don't die, we'll take ours. <laughs> <laughs> Dolly Parton's funding one for us. We're on our way. Yes. yes. <laughs> Who knew, uh, 2020, prime 2020, <laughs> Dolly Parton is saving the white day. Seriously. Yeah. You know, you got to leave it to her to speak the words of wisdom that we're not getting from the leaders. It's mind blowing. Right. I'm like, Dolly. listen, Dolly Parton. Woo. Holy crap. <laughs> Who would think that she's the voice of reason in 2020? Not that she's not a reasonable woman, but I mean, like, come on. I thought we had leaders. <laughs> mm -hmm. This year leaders is bonkers. That, leaders that believe in science. Simple as that. It's, 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 it, you know, and like you said, James, it's like they've been saying, oh, yes, oh, yes, another wave is coming. It's going to get worse. Another wave it's is exactly coming. exactly what they said worse. it was going to be. There's no surprises here. And as no, far no. as the president and the conceding, no surprises there. We no, knew no. that if he lost, he would let this country burn, and this country is burning. Mm -hmm. Big time. It's a, very, it's a very weird time, too, because, and, and not to dismiss what we do here or what, we do an entertainment period, but it's a very strange time to, oh yeah, I've got a movie. Oh, I've got a show. Oh, I've got this to promote. It's a very weird time. Has it, it affected has. you in any way with that I'm, on that? I mean, it has, I mean, to some degree, I haven't been active on social media that much. I think that people need to be paying more attention to what's going on and less mm. on social media. If they mm. can find the links and the sources to connect to the current affairs and events, then that's awesome. But I'm not a conduit for that. Okay. I've never been a conduit for that. I'm here, you know, I need these, I'm just like, I'm not a political leader. You know, I mm -hmm. do have my opinions and, you know, I've stated them kind of a little bit on here and it's not even necessarily that I'm neutral, but people need to really figure out for themselves that it's not about left and right or any of that. It's mm -hmm. about what's good for the for the people and if you can't make a decision based on what's good for the people but only what's good for your team that's how we ended up where exactly where we're at now yeah exactly yeah you know, well i need to win even if a half a million people are going to be dead in another month then you're like that's unbelievable you're just going to let these people freaking die you're going to let it run yeah yeah. Wow. Thank you. It's, it's so, insane. Yeah, and, and it is precarious. You know, I didn't work after the pilot. I had a movie that was canceled. We picked it back up. I mean, I'm, after, you know, the first wave and in the summertime, it kind of picked back up. And so I've done a few little projects here and there. And then the last project I did two weeks ago, we all tested positive. Yeah, we all tested positive. Then we went and filmed. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, we're making a COVID movie. Phrasing. <laughs> but uh, we all tested negative and filmed. And then I get a call a week later saying the focus puller had tested positive. Ooh. Oh, you shit. know, and as the actor, you got to take your mask off on set indoor. Right. Thankfully, I was only there for, it was a small part. I was, I was going to do two scenes in the movie and ended up, one got cut. Oh, wow. They we're running out of time. You know, the, the time constraints is another thing with the uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. and the guidelines we need to follow which thankfully we followed them so well, we got good. tested again all of us and nobody came up positive and then you do another seven days you get tested again everybody's fine but i can tell you that's a i don't want to go through that again oh, yeah. i don't like that i don't like having to quarantine not being able to go out and don't know if i got it it's like they're saying on you know like they're saying it on the news and they're right they're like just because you test it doesn't mean that you're safe you can test right. positive tomorrow don't yeah. travel and you're like everybody's like elbow to elbow in the freaking airports and you're like yeah. this is why it's propagating you know we focus on a lot of negative things and as an artist for me anyway you know playing music and trying to stay sane and i don't just mean that i'm an artist because i make movies you know you can be an artist without making movies you can be artists mm -hmm. if you express yourself in a creative fashion all of us every every single one of us mm -hmm. so that being said it's like so you need to make the best of your situation no matter where you're at you know i've had rough years in acting where i was quarantined not because there was a disease outside but because i was poor yeah <laughs> and i can't afford to go out and i can't afford to do these things so i have to stay in otherwise i'm gonna be in big trouble yeah. And so I've had those sure, moments. There. So, 
yeah, in that, you know, so what do you do? Because you get these jobs that pull you out of it. Well, you have to be ready for that job when it comes up. So you have to keep rehearsing or working on play pieces or film pieces that you love. Keep playing music, work on the muscle memory for the brain. Hmm. And I'll tell you this, and this is my advice to everybody during the quarantine, to you guys and everyone. All those things you always wanted to do in your life that you said you never had time to do, learn to play an instrument, write a script, paint a, paint a picture, whatever it is, do it now. Because when this is done, we'll never get this time again, ever. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, this is awesome, but you're like, you can do something with this. Yeah. You know, yeah I don't mean exactly. to be cheesy. I, I learned to play Johnny Marr, the Smith song guitar. I never thought in my life I would nice. learn to do that. You know, you give me three months, like 12 hours a day. I'm a, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm, teach, I'm teaching myself them, harmonica. But. I got you, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and that just because, you know, I, I mean, I grew up playing piano. I was a classically trained piano player when I was a kid and then picked up the guitar when I was 18. And because I could hear it, it was easy for me to pick it up. But the things you can do and achieve and attain with all those dreams that we have, because we all have these dreams, mm -hmm. especially yeah. what we're on here now in this uh, interview talking about it. And I can yeah. see behind you the same inspiration that <laughs> you have as mine as well. I mean, I'm sure. in a temporary room because I'm in between places right before the Stan pandemic. <laughs> oh, no. But Fire. yeah, um, <laughs> how did that happen? What what, what the hell happened? I moved oh, out. I moved out of my place last year, and I uh, moved in with a friend, and it was just going to be for six months. Mm -hmm. And I ended up working those whole six months. So we pushed it up a little bit, and then the you know quarantine hit, yeah. mm. and everything changed. And it's like I'm glad you didn't move out. I'm like I'm glad I didn't move out too. Yes, yeah, <laughs> we'll stay here. Let's just keep it that way for now. <laughs> we'll see it through. <laughs> yeah, and it's so it's been a good thing. That's, that's been a good thing. Right and kind of looping back to, you you know, you, you keep mentioning music and that you're a big music fan. Um, do you kind of correlate the two? Like, do you listen to music to get into headspace for a role? Or do you find that it influences your performances? Always. I used to make these little mixtapes for every character I had. Wow. And then mix CDs, of course. Now it's just playlists. But yeah. mm. like, for instance, Frank the Bunny for me, when I first got that for Donnie Darko, I was listening... To me, he immediately what came to mind was Mr. Greaves by the Pixies. Mm. Oh my God! And that yeah. is you, nice. Frank. He's Mr. Greaves. You can cry, you can moke, but can you swing from a good rope? Oh, I <laughs> believe dirt, dirt, yeah. in Mr. Oh, Greaves. Oh, oh, there it is, Mr. <laughs> Greaves. That's awesome. So oh he became God. Mr. Greaves to me. <laughs> that is and so I used cool. to say that to Rich while we're shooting. I'm like, I'm Mr. Greaves. I'm listening to it right now in my headphones. <laughs> it's amazing the, the impact that that movie still has. People know that bunny. Everybody knows that character. How often do you get that? How often do people say that to you? Say, oh, Darko the bunny or anything like that. You know, it's been an interesting journey with that movie because uh, mm. when we did it, you know, my initial in, in impression when I read the script was, you know, this was in 99. I'm like, wow, this is cool. This is like a modern day Twilight Zone. No one's done this. This is super freaking cool. Hold on. I got to read this again. And they were like, what? And then I read it, you know, five or six times and, and, and made sense to it. And then while we were making it, it, everything seemed to just come together, to be quite honest. Like the crew, the actors, everything seemed to just really flow super super smooth shot the film in 28 days it came out at sundance there was a massive division about whether it was a good movie or a bad movie literally at the first screening i went to someone got up and said it was the worst movie at the entire festival and then someone else got up and said i disagree i think it's the best movie at the entire festival and at that moment again we all thought i think we have something because this is it's actually good that it's it's so polarizing like that you know, because that means that that's a, it's got, you have a broad spectrum for this. We got distribution, it was tough to get distribution actually. And then when we got it, they were like, we, it was the, the people, it was New Market who only picked up Memento before. So they're like, yeah, they're like, well, we do, I guess at that point, like, well, we do weird movies, you know? So we don't care what you do, just cut 10 minutes out of it. So the Sundance cut, Rich took 10 minutes out, which he didn't want to, but he cut 10 minutes for theatrical length reasons. We came out in the theater, we're in the theater for about three weeks, made less than half a million dollars or a little over half a million dollars. And as we all know, in the current environment, even back then, if you're not making a hundred million dollars in a weekend, you're just a failure. 
I'm like, we didn't even make a million in three weeks. <laughs> so it was this massive failure, which was heartbreaking to be honest, because I thought it was a really cool movie. And it was, an, uh, it was a special experience. Um, it was a couple years later, I'm walking through Staples and security guard goes, Frank. <laughs> I was like, uh, excuse me? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm James. He's like, no, no, no. I mean, I, Frank, I just saw Donnie Dark. I was like, wow, that's awesome, man. Like you and like 50 other people. <laughs> but I'm glad you saw it because I'm really proud of that movie. And he's like, oh, yeah, man, that was a really cool movie. I really loved it. I thought you, you thought it was great. I thought you were great. That was a really good feeling. And it was like the first time I'd heard any kind of acknowledgement in a couple years since it came out, since mm -hmm. like 2003 when he told me this. Yeah. And then about six months later, someone said it again. And I was kind of like, wow, that's, that's crazy. So cool, people are watching. And then within a year, bam, everyone's like, Donnie Darko, Donnie Darko. Yeah. So by 2004, it became this whole mm -hmm. kind of super, yeah, kind of like this whole super cool reemergence. And it's kind of just kept a life of its own since then. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, it's, I mean, I'm more happy about that and having a movie that stands the test of time 20 years than being in something that was a hit and then goes away six months later and then no one talks about it five or 10 years later, even if it's something I'm super proud of. You know, like, for instance, like one movie that I felt really, like, I feel that way about that I really loved and I loved making was Go with Doug Lyman. Oh, like, God, I love that movie, yeah. <laughs> but no one talks about it or watches it, which is fine. I mean, and it's not like that with everything, you know what I mean? But, you know, you have, there's a few movies in my career where I have that ex similar experience. Sure. And they don't have that same kind of life. On a side note, I actually just bought that. And it not preparing for the interview, I literally saw it. I was like, oh, yeah, I got to buy this again. So it's I, just I, such a fun movie. You steal my sunshine. Oh God, the soundtrack. <laughs> well, we will we'll encourage our viewers to go check it out. I feel like Donnie Darko was one of the films that kind of got that extra life on video, and that, and then oh, it became, yeah, man. you know, now look at it. Like, yeah, and it continues to thrive on video and on demand, or. Um, now it's, I think it's Netflix has it, so streaming, but it continues, you know, it continues to have a life. You know, yeah. I still hear for once in a while people contact me about it, which is super nice. Well, you look no, the it's, same. It's so. the cult. <laughs> it just developed this like cult following. I remember being, I was in high school and, you know, I was, you know, one of the, one of the weird kids. And like, I remember one of my friends being like, quoting Donnie Dark. I'm like, wait, what, what, what is this you're talking about? What's this bunny? What's this rabbit? And he's like. Come over tonight. I'm going to show you something. And we like, yeah, and I mean, we had like a cult screening of it in his living room. And I, it stuck with me. I was like, this movie's great. That is honestly, that's the biggest compliment. I mean, one of the things I did before I was an actor that we used to do is we used to, as we do all fans, we learn the lines and we quote them constantly. Mm -hmm. So one of those movies for us growing up was Breakfast Club. Yes. Nice. Absolutely. <laughs> Just like another, hey, yo, hey, can I bow my doobage? <laughs> 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 PB and J with the crust cut off. <laughs> <laughs> Who was Nailed your it. favorite uh, Burt Reynolds Club <laughs> character? Who did you relate to the most? I was more like Bender, but I related to Emilio Estevez's character more. The like the pressure from the father, even though you know they both have it. Yeah. It was like that whole thing of like win, win. Even though my dad's, he's not necessarily like that. But I identified yeah. with him in in some ways. And I'm not even a, I wasn't a wrestler. wasn't a sporty dude. I mean, I guess I was in football and weightlifting for a season, so I didn't have to go to class. But uh. <laughs> I didn't get out early, and then yeah, so I'd have a PE class, a weightlifting class, and a football three times a day. You know? Oh my gosh! Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I, you know, you've also tasted the big world with Independence Day. What? what how does that compare to doing a film like Donnie Darko? I mean, because people still celebrate Independence Day. Well, literally and figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to say, I mean, nice phrasing, Matt. <laughs> I, think, I think the thing with, with Independence Day, which it's uh, that's another one that has a very, you know, I hold close to my heart. Mm. I was doing that while I was doing Greg Rocky's Nowhere. So I was actually shooting those movies at the same time. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, so I would I shot the first week in L.A. with Greg Rocky and then took the earrings off, switched my part, went and get into a completely different wardrobe out on a $100 million movie or $70 million movie back in 95, which would yeah. be like $150 million mm. movie now, but. And the reason why I'm telling you this story is because that kind of solidified not only being able to play a lot of different characters, but really kind of how uncomplicated it really was. When I go from one set 
with one set of actors and one director who directs stylistically with a certain budget. And I go to a certain one, even if, you know, it doesn't have to be a hundred million dollars, but, and it's a different budget and it's a different filmmaker with a different set of sensibilities and a different crew of actors and a different crew and your environment's different and your dialogue's different and your wardrobe's different. I can say that what's nice about that is it makes it easy as an actor to just walk into set and slip right into it because everything's this, right? It's this illusion here. So we just need to make it look real here, how we're dressed, what you're seeing behind. If the car flips, even though there's a chain, maybe there's a chain and we can't remove that, we'll digitally remove it or whatever, yeah. you know? But I mean, it's all about what happens in that frame. So everybody on set is focused on making that frame work and look good and, and seem believable. And it's one of the most important things I learned as an actor is like also to go from set to set and learn that everybody, because of this, everyone has a different process. Mm -hmm. Actors, cameramen, wardrobe, makeup, other actors, directors, producers, they all have their own idea and process of how they work and how they get there. And it's really learning to, I think, meld with that mm -hmm. and be able to be, be feasible. So in that flexibility, you can work together instead of like, well, I work this way. And so you need to work that way. And that's where you have problems and you hear about them all the time. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. actor doesn't like this actor. They don't like this director, you know, and I'm not necessarily a judge or a, a know all, know it all, you know, been there and done everything kind of guy yeah. on any level. But from almost 30 years of experience, I can say that usually a lot of that has to do with respect for someone else's process that is completely alien to yours. And then when you think about that, it's really like that in everyday life and yeah. whatever, whatever situation you walk into. So keeping that in mind and learning to be collaborative, and since films are extremely collaborative, is really the kind of key to not only making it through this business happy and having a good time what you're doing, mm -hmm. but I think to really having a cohesive set and work environment. Now, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about Beast Mode a little bit because that's that's one of your uh, your upcoming projects. Yeah. And um, so my first question was kind of what attracted you to this project? It's it, it was a different performance than I'm used to seeing from you. I had gotten introduced through mutual friends to Spain and to Chris, and mm. it was more like they were looking for an actor. And he's like, but I suggested you, so they'd interested and love to meet you. So in the end, it was really more I'm just thankful that they agreed to go my way. Mm. Of course, I love the script and the character, but it's like, before I delve into that, are they willing to see me play this or mm. interested in, in having me work on this? And then at, at that point, once it got cleared and they sent me the script, it was kind of like, I saw it not only as two roles, but three roles. So very early on in my career, like I was just saying earlier with Independence Day and Nowhere, you know, to be in two different movies at the same time where I'm on one one week, one on the other, one one week, one on the other. And then I've done a few where I've shot at the same time where I had to shoot in the morning on one, wrap out and go to another one on, in the evening. So I had never got a chance to play two characters at the same time on the same project anyway. So I'd been wanting to do something like that. And as, you, as you've as you seen, uh, it's super outrageous and like balls to the wall and crude even. And, and I like to, you know, I'm a fan of that. You know, so, you know, like I said, you know, you, the other movies you can go back that I'm inspired by in the 70s were also like Caddyshack and all the National Lampoon movies. So yeah, I, I could be a bit crude and I have that and you know, it's no offense to anyone unless you want to be offended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, de it definitely um, has some yeah. of those vibes. Had enough like of the cancel comedy. culture, you know. If you don't like someone, don't watch their stuff. I feel that way too, but I'm not going to cancel someone I don't like. I mean, the thing is when you, look, we all get offended by something. Like we'll see a movie and maybe it's a joke that we don't like or don't appreciate. Most, the human reaction is just like, okay, well, I don't like that joke. So I'm not going to really laugh at that joke, but I can move on. We're in an age where, oh my gosh, that joke, everyone involved in this whole film, should be canceled and it, it makes no sense yeah and you know there were a poss couple possible moments while you know we were doing the script reading over that and it was just mm. like kind of like mm. you know we're this if you're taking it seriously a movie like this then you got issues like this movie is <laughs> like honestly this movie is just balls to the wall crazy fun yeah for sure. so it does have a point and then at the same time it has a poignant message you know it's and not just about fame and film and television and movies but just for this day and age and social media. Yeah. Yeah. This, I would, well, well, I think it holds up a mirror to Hollywood in a really interesting way. I mean, it's a very, it's a little cynical. Did you, do you it, feel? Like I think it's very cynical, yeah, but in yeah. all the right ways, in all yeah, the ways, yeah. and in all the ways that I am in, in real life, you know, I, what's strange is, you know, 
I think when I was much younger, I really had a different idea of how the business worked. And then as I got older, and I love to do interviews, especially with people I know and talk about it. And I'm always open to doing stuff like that. But at the same time, I'm also like, I like to, which is why I'm not super active on social media. I don't think people should know a whole lot about me since I'm creating an illusion, what you see on here. The less people know about me, the better. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky thing because we have, you know, we're in an age where we have uh, the Kardashians and all this stuff. And it's literally... Your life is up for public consumption everywhere. Yes. And that's just... Mm -hmm. Because I was raised early in, for me in my career in film in the 90s, it was all about fighting against that. Yeah. But fighting against something that is generation later has become something that everyone's embraced. Is I've, I've come to terms with that, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. I remember um, uh, Emma Thompson once said... She was talking about it was when YouTube was becoming a thing, like a serious thing. And she's like, yeah, I remember when actors had that actually train <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's like it, it also reminds me, you know, I'll, I'll leave the film and the director nameless just because it's not that super important. But I remember yeah. someone filming and they go, oh, well, you know, there's a C stand in the shot. And I'm like, well, I'll just fucking don't move it. We'll just erase it in, in post. It's like, why don't you just fucking move the C stand and then you have to pay to remove the fucking post? Yeah, That's seriously. Stupid. It doesn't make sense. It's hundreds and thousands of dollars instead of having a grip go over, pick up the thing and take it out of the frame. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? What about <laughs> I, their eye lines? We'll fix them in uh, post. What? Why don't you just put a piece of tape up and we'll look at that piece of tape? See, I like, can do that. It's called acting. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I, of course like, it helps if it's someone's face or yeah. you know, someone there to react, but sometimes you can't do that because of the angle of the camera or whatnot. Yeah. I work in post-production and like the stuff that you're talking about, the amount of times I've audibly yelled at my monitor, like, just fix it there. <laughs> you know, and of course, again, it's like different processes. So I don't, I never at the same time tell someone else yeah, how to right. film or how to shoot or whatnot. Still. Yeah. But, you know, I've produced a couple times and you know, I have my opinions about things when I'm filming. I tend to stay quiet because okay. I like to focus on the acting and let the people I've hired do the job. But behind the curtains, I can be like, yeah, you know what? Like, let's like not do that. <laughs> See, this, this, Jimmy, this is why you're working constantly and you work constantly. I was looking at your, oh, uh, like, your you IMDb is it's like insane. a grocery list. Yeah, yeah. I try to, you know, I'm <laughs> trying to become a better actor. And I think that the best way is by challenging myself to do, you know, it was, it was a big compliment earlier to say that you hadn't seen me do something like this before necessarily because I'm still trying to do things I haven't done across all genres, especially now that I've been doing it for a while and I'm a lot more comfortable, you know, from, I, I remember I did a romantic, romantic comedy or dramedy a couple mm. years back and did a couple musicals, one with Anthony Rapp, he's now in Star Trek, but originally came from Rent, mm -hmm. the original cast member oh, of yeah. Rent, sci-fi, um, dogma films, you know, by Lars Ron, you know, executive produced by Lars Ron Schurz. I do want wow. to talk Really, just going out and, yeah. you know, small movies with Greg Rocky, big movies like with Roland and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Dominic Senna and Gone in 60 Seconds and Nicolas Cage. You know, I'm, I like to consider myself after all these years, I've attempted Renaissance Man. Right. And Ooh. so it's more of like, whatever you've got, I can make it work. So I remember there was a point in my career when people would go, so what, what's your type? So you're like the hero, the villain. I'm like, I'll tell you that. I'm what you would call the cleanup guy. I'm the fix-it guy. When you cast a movie and someone drops out or you can't, you don't know who to cast for that character. Strangely enough, the character in Gone in 60 Seconds, they were having a hard time casting Freb. Mm. Mm. And then I went in and I was like, I gave it to kind of a different approach. And that's kind of how I got the part. Same thing with Donnie Darko, believe it or not. I just gave a different approach than, you know, at the end of the day than everybody else did. Yeah. Wow. According to the filmmakers. Um, <laughs> and I think in the last, especially the last 10, 15 years, I'm like, let's just go for it. Let's just, what do you got? As yeah. long as it's not going to be, a, as long as I can stomach it, you know, <laughs> and I'm not super busy and it's not taking away from something I really love to do. There's nothing wrong, in my opinion, with working on the craft and working on a project. Every project you're trying to make work, no matter how well or horrible it's written, mm -hmm. we're all trying to make it work. And you have to work at certain degrees to do it. So that being said, the I think the system never changes. You're always trying to work on it. Yeah. You know, it's just a little bit more challenging sometimes. And well, if you're not up to, up to snuff and up to par, then why are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. You know, so I kind of, I step up to that. And 
I have to say there's also been times when I've not been happy doing that too, which is also part of it. And the wonderful part about that is, and my advice to anyone else, not just in acting, but when you're having that hard time in a, in a career where you're constantly going from place to place, know that it is very temporary. So I swear you'd be like, fuck this when I was younger. Now I'm like, yeah, two more weeks, one more week, <laughs> three more days. And I've done that. I remember I was doing a movie with an unnamed actor and I was so happy to be working with him the first day and it was awesome. And the second day was like, who the fuck is this guy? Wow. And then I, I was like, I, from then I'm like two days and 10 hours, two days Man. and six hours. And the next day I'm like two days, two days and eight hours. Two days. And the last I'm like, last day. Eight hours, six hours, two hours, one hour. <laughs> I'm wrapped and I'm never coming back. I'm fucking out of here. I did it. And there was an accomplishment about not freaking out, about not doing those things that you wanted to, you know, or react in a way that's probably, to be honest, really unbecoming. Sure. And so I learn and I feel like I grow as a person as well as an artist in those situations. So again, it's like I'm not purposely trying to thrust myself into them, but they happen from time to time mm -hmm. when you take on a lot. Mm -hmm. But then it is rewarding because there is something rewarding about saying that situation didn't kill me. I didn't have to act like an asshole or say something rude and I didn't. That's what it's about in the end. Can you work with people? Then you're going to do well. The problem working with people, you'll probably not be very happy and neither will anybody. Else. And you know, you, you've covered so many different genres. You're working left and right, all these different roles and categories. Like, is there a type? of role or even a more specific one that you haven't tackled yet that you really like to sink your teeth into like i really want to play this in my career yeah i want to be a jedi or a sith nice <laughs> <laughs> i like i've been in star wars yet hint hint right. how is that you need to be in star wars this has to happen man <laughs> yes that's the whole reason i you know before yoga when i was young when i did stunt fighting for swords and gymnastics and martial arts it was with the idea of being in a star wars movie when i was a kid and i remember doing this movie and i was running with this bow and i flipped and just did a running flip and the guy's like Dup. and i'm like well that was so i could be in stars so i get to be in stars and in this movie so i'll do it here you know what i mean <laughs> like, you know, your character's a hemophiliac right i don't know if he knows how to flip i'm like well he does in this movie <laughs> <laughs> nice. You just cut the flip. <laughs> <laughs> see, now I, I want like to it. see you flip in every movie. I think that right? would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ryan had mentioned uh, Dogma. You're doing Dogma films. And yeah, what, what was I want to loop back. Yeah, what was that experience like? Because I'm a huge sucker for that stuff, too, as well. Right. Like, was, what challenges as an actor did that present? It was, it, was a, it was really challenging. In fact, I shot the Dogma film... When I was shooting Donnie Darko, which was a 28 day shoot, mm -hmm. I took 10 days off from the shoot and I went and filmed half of the doc. Wow. <laughs> so I was actually filming two movies at that time, of at course. the same time. You do so a I shot it. two weeks on Donnie Darko. <laughs> then I went to go do this movie Americana with the director mm -hmm. of SLC Punk. Mm -hmm. And nice. that was a dogma film where we just had this rough premise and then we went on the road and you know the dogma rules you know whatever props you have props you got to use you know you mm -hmm. can't add something that's not there for instance we're on a road trip so we go do a campfire so we have a campfire and we have flashlights and we just put the flashlights down so we can see each other's faces and you shoot like that wow yeah, you had to use natural light right that was one of the rules yeah mm -hmm. you know we, we could have the flashlights because our characters had flashlights on the trip on the because they're camping right so we could use those <laughs> we had a radio with us so we could play music in the scene, you know what I mean? But it's going to come out of the radio. So it was challenging in the sense of like, then we would shoot a scene and, and you would go for a 20 minute take. That's all improv and ad lib. That's super cool. Yeah, it, so yeah. it was wild. Um, there were some amazing things. It's like I, this one character's girlfriend breaks up with him and I play like this kind of, I don't want to say weirdo. I want to say special. Um, but I want to say someone a little different. Mm -hmm. Let's just say he's a little mm -hmm. different. Um, when his girlfriend breaks up with him, I'm like, you know what you need is you need to get away. Is my uncle just died and left me a Harley, South Dakota. You should fly with me. We'll pick up the Harley, do a little road trip, wind in the hair, stars in the sky, and you forget all about her. And so he decides to come on the trip with me, and we land there. And we show up, and the guy doesn't seem, the guy supposedly my uncle doesn't seem to know me, but he knows what I'm talking about, so takes me to the back, lifts it up, and it's a little Vespa scooter. <laughs> and now we got to ride this Vespa scooter back to LA. 
So the whole movie is just ride on the Vespa back to LA. So awesome. you got us going through the Black Hills, which is funny. So when you're shooting it, there's certain things you're going to get that you can't plan. Like they're shooting us and, you know, when I'm, he's going to leave me in South Dakota. But once he leaves me, he sees me with the bike and I'm like, just looking at it. He's like, well, aren't you going to ride him? I'm like, I don't know how to ride. He's like, you don't know how to ride a bike. You have me fly to South Dakota to ride him a Harley Davidson back with you to LA and you don't know how to ride a bike. I'm like, well, no, I thought you knew. <laughs> He's like, I'm going home. I'm like, well, well, what am I supposed to do? And he's like, God damn it, all right. Well, I'm going to ride you to Salt Lake, and I'm getting on a plane. You learn how to ride, and I'm going home. And it's that crazy trip begins. And so we're going through the Black Hills in South Dakota, and you see the picture of us, and I'm like all happy with these big goggles, the big helmet, and I'm holding on to him, and he's like this big sour look on his face in the scooter. And you realize it's only going 35, and you see the camera just kind of pan to the side, and there's literally like 30 cars behind <laughs> And that was because we were on a freaking scooter shooting in the fucking mountain. You know what I mean? Like, you couldn't... It would be so difficult to execute that, to plan yeah. that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it was so cool that you have a lot of moments like that where we didn't have to do that. Mm. To make it even, I think, a little extra more kind of funky weird is I carry this mandolin around with me and I kind of make up these really annoying songs and play them and sing them throughout the movie. I love what you do, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> this, well, this, yeah, this is so, I mean, without being, I should cut it long story short, but yeah, so this is the Americana movie and I am very proud of it. It was a very mm -hmm. cool experiment. It was, sometimes it was super tough. It was all kind of on the cuff, just shooting wherever we went. A lot of these locations were just literally on the side of the road between here and South Dakota. That's kind of amazing. Yeah. And now you're back. You you've been doing a lot of horror lately. I mean, you're kind of why what it why horror? What is it about that particular genre mm -hmm. that you seem to enjoy? Um, they're willing to cast me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I wish you know. I I know so so many actors would be pissed. I'm just a whore. Pay me, and I'm there. And I'll do it. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, like, and, and in the sense of like Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye, like actors are prostitutes. Well, like, yeah, doing it for money. Man. <laughs> yeah. Doing it for yeah. free. Not yeah. anymore. Not unless I'm rich. Yeah, not doing it for free right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and that's a funny thing. When I started, I did. I did do it for free. And I've done things without asking for money here and there if I don't need it, you know. But I mean, I think we all understand in this day and age, you know, unless you've been on a television series, which I have not, we all need some money. How about some relief there, Congress? <laughs> yes, amen. Yeah, Congress, if you're watching our horror talk show, get on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was only possibly Andrew Yang, but that's only because he used to Maybe. listen to the Dead Kennedys. He used to be a yeah, punk rock. Okay, okay. Who knew that? You know, Send me a picture of that. I'm like, look at that! <laughs> so, Jimmy, you want to hear something cool? Andrew Yang follows me on Twitter. See, right. uh, maybe he's here and listening so right because Andrew Yang's hip. He's cool. Tweet him. He's awesome. Tw yeah, and, him, and what's crazy is, you know, I'm not again. I'm not this big political dude, but you know that CARES Act made a case for universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Yes, that mm -hmm. just proved Absolutely. Andrew Yang's point. Absolutely, one hundred percent. You're in a lot of movies that I love. You're in Independence Day, Donnie Darko, SLC Punk, but there's you have. This is kind of a deeper cut, but you're in one of my seasonal favorites, Tales of Halloween. Oh, and yeah, that I, is, you oh, have yeah. this like super fun scene where you play this hardcore bloody Halloween fan and you face off against this like softer yeah, monster yeah, Gould, guy. So He's great. Amazing to work with. I was jazzed about that episode. Which side would you fall on in real life? Would you be more the, the bloody, gory Halloween guy or the kind of monster rash, softer? Oh, see, that's the weird thing. I'm literally <laughs> caught in between the two. Yeah. You know, I was scared of Frankenstein and I was, you know, and Dracula and Nos, especially naturally Nosferatu. Mm, but, yeah. you know, again, I was raised even for me in the 70s with Halloween and then shortly after The Fog and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and all the original horror movies before even sequels existed. So I have a reverence for those blood and gore. Mm. But I also have a reverence because, like I said before, I was mentioning Frankenstein and the werewolf and... You know, but you think about, like, Nosferatu, which is from the 20s, that's probably the creepiest of them all. Oh, yeah. Like, I, that yeah, thing is it's so freaky. It's, 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 Jesus <laughs> Christ, how did they do yes. so amazing they I did know, that in the 20s? So I still can't get over that. I'm like, nightmares right? about that when I was a kid. So freaky. And I, you know, and it's like, I don't really, as I'm older, nightmare very easy. You know, I know mm -hmm. that I've had a few people come over... And, you know, because Frank just sits in the corner of my room. I love that. So that people are like, that doesn't cool. bother you? I'm like, no. Does it bother you? It's like, well, kind of creepy. 
Like I had, you know, I mean, we're not together anymore with someone I was with uh, recently and she woke up. She's having trouble sleeping because she'd wake up in the middle of the night and look at that. <laughs> that's oh, crazy. No. And I'm like, no, it's okay. It's just, that's me. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was me. I mean, I if you watch the movie, it's not even a creature. I mean, my mm -hmm. character designed it in the montage in the very end with the sketch. <laughs> it's really, if you, if you wake up and I only have one eyeball, then you might be... <laughs> Then yeah. you know, yeah. You had the just cause to be a little alarmed, yeah. <laughs> just as a fan of that movie, I love that you casually just have that chilling in the corner. Yeah. That's that's great, man. That seriously is. Uh, well, quick, uh, can't sure see, this real. is my jacket from Independence Day. Oh, what? Oh, really? Oh, wait, let me see. Hold on. Oh, check it out. Yeah, this is oh, Miguel's my. jacket from Independence Day. I've got all kinds oh, of weird sick. like props and clothing that I keep that I've had oh, since I love it, man. back in the day. What, now, do you keep something from every movie? Do you try I try to. to. Now, That's this so is going to be wild, but this little ashtray is the red ashtray from the Doom Generation Red Hotel Room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's awesome. By the way, that is one of, that is one of my favorite movies of all time, by the way. I That's love Doom Generation so fucking much. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a weird, crazy, fun movie to make. I mean, there was a, yeah. and what was funny is they, I remember they auctioned everything off from the sets and people got like a chair and some really cool stuff hmm. and at the end the producer had gotten that ashtray and then she just left it behind i'm like i'll take it <laughs> wow. that's super cool <laughs> no, i love that i'll take it i got something from doom generation 25 that's years so later rad. yeah it's crazy <laughs> and then i think from nowhere i have my little uh sock <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> well, it's still got the blood on it from when the guy explodes and becomes a cockroach <laughs> are you serious that's sick i gotta say i love what greg does i i just think he's such an interesting filmmaker mm. i'm still he, I'm still a fan of his i'm, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that because you know in a lot of ways it's like not in, in every way i you know i have him to thank or i wouldn't be making movies i wouldn't be an actor really and not only for believing in me but actually being the I think the quality of director that he is, because he's got a lot more stuff coming. Awesome. I can't. I know wait, we'll man. be working together again on something, so we can't wait to show you what it is. Then you never know, because Greg, he's kind of like George Lucas, from way back mm -hmm. in Doom Generation till now. He's like, well, I can't tell you, I'd have to kill you. So you just have to wait, <laughs> literally, he's as he says, I can't tell you, I'd have, to, I'd have to kill you. So you have to wait for him to just call you up, and then he just goes, Oh, I want you to use the script and look at this character, and you're like. <laughs> nice yeah it sounds like he's one of those guys that you would work with just no if he calls you hey i'm doing a movie okay i'm done yeah i'd do anything with him anything wow i know actually i was on a series that just didn't get re-picked back up it only did one season but I, you know he had me coming as the homeless mm -hmm. guy gets raped by space aliens mm -hmm. i by the way I'm i like, did love that series I now apocalypse oh you saw it yeah dude. i'm like of course so when he when he actually asked me i know I know my, 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 I think it was my manager agent's like, you're going to do this? I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> fuck yeah, look at this. This is freaking hilarious. And it, and the only problem that I had while I was shooting that was keeping a straight face. <laughs> I don't know why. That's a very serious thing to be raped by Jack. <laughs> <laughs> the amazing thing about Greg and when you work with him from the very first script that he sent me to Doom Generation Nowhere all the way through till now, his scripts are works of art mm. in their own. I kid you not. I've not laughed as hard in years before or since I read Now Apocalypse. And I was like, I haven't read that, laughed that hard probably since Kaboom. Mm -hmm. And I didn't laugh that hard since like, this is how the world ends, which is this pilot we did for MTV that didn't get picked up. But mm. they're just so freaking crazy and outrageous as you, as you saw. Yeah. And I remember reading Now Apocalypse and laughing and just going like, how the hell is he getting money to make this at this day and age? Like this movie's so freaking, or this series is so offensive to so many people. <laughs> Which is why I love it. I mean, it. not me. Yeah. I relish, you know, I revel in it. I dance in it. <laughs> like a demon. This is why I dig you, Jimmy. That's why I dig you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just think, you know, then that's, with Greg, that's what makes him uniquely, you know, powerful filmmakers he always makes movies that are true to his sensibilities mm. you know especially in the 90s and the emergence of of indie film and sundance and uh the beginning really not that people didn't do indie before yeah. but the first i think initial breakout mm -hmm. you know and uh i could be more proud to have come out of that than than with greg yeah
I learned a lot. <laughs> well, Dave, now you have a scary story for us to finish it off. There'll be food and drink and ghosts and perhaps even a few murders. You're all invited. I'm glad you asked. I was doing this movie called Evolution, another kind of horror zombie movie with Guillermo Diaz. And we play kind of these gangsters and we'd just been, and we're shooting at the old Santa Fe Railroad Hospital, which has already been rumored to be extremely haunted. And we'd gone around and I remember with one of the other actors, Nathan Bexton from Go and Montgomery from Nowhere, who was also in Evolution. We went around taking photos in the room with the digital cameras. This is from 2007. And we started getting all these orbs. So, yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, I think the orbs are pieces of dust reflecting in the sun, <laughs> in the light when the flash goes off, because it was really dusty in there, and you didn't get them in all the rooms. But uh, that being said, you know, and believe it or not, I still have those photos. I just don't, yeah, I don't think that they're what we thought they were then when I went back and looked at them. But what I do remember is a lot of people were doing, like, sort of these because there's no lights in there unless you bring them in and the fifth floor is all closed. So a lot of people would do these little ghost adventures up there. And after shooting one time, it was like two in the morning. Uh, we had gone, Guillermo and I were walking back to uh, rooms, our dressing rooms, which were in a separate wing of the hospital, a totally different building. And as we're walking, there was these two metal doors, those metal hospital doors, and they're being held by cinder blocks. And we're walking and all of a sudden, all the electricity goes up, the cinder blocks fly and those things slam shut. Ooh. And there's no one in the building but Guillermo and I. Oh my God. Oh, that's freaky. <laughs> so I remember Guillermo and I just going like, ah, ran to our rooms. <laughs> oh, that's super freaky. <laughs> First thing, it was more like we held on to each other. Ah, the lights came on. Ah, and then we ran to our rooms. <laughs> Well, that hey, well, you know, we because this show is on Viddy Space and we do a lot of paranormal, we mm -hmm. we may go into doing like some ghost hunt. So you should join us. I'd yeah, love to. Um, check out that place. I mean, I know they used to cremate the bodies at midnight, mm -hmm. and then they would bake bread to cover the smell. Ah, well, ooh, so that went on for quite a few decades over at the Santa Fe Railroad Hospital. Also, I guess when they abandoned it, which is like most people have seen this they left a lot of the old medical files there so they were experimenting with low-income immigrants and railroad workers back in the early 20th century oh like God. 1920s that 1930s giving them drugs that didn't really work to see what the side effects would be so this stuff kind of stuff's been going on you know you hear about yeah. it uh but it was happening here in la too at this hospital probably still going on okay. nowadays that is grim the thing about the horror stories i found out years later from the makeup guy alex that it was him who had done that oh oh Flipped the lights and so he's messing with you oh he was messing with you. he was hiding in the building <laughs> so we believed this for a good probably five or six years he had us going <laughs> Plot twist. And he was doing it to other people too. I found out later he was going into that floor that was abandoned and hiding in a room with infrared glasses because you can't. See anything. Wow. Oh wow. You Plot you guys got time. Scooby Dude. We got Scooby Dude. <laughs> if it wasn't for you meddling kids, <laughs> seriously. Actually, for him, it was like no meddling kids here. <laughs> <laughs> Not ones that were smart enough. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to mention this is uh, the first time we've actually had our producer Rusty on board with us. So it's Ryan, Rusty, and me, and we're so ha happy to have you, dude. And uh, of course, we got to plug it one more time. Beast Mode, Beast Mode, Beast Mode is playing now as we speak. So mm -hmm. Beast Mode, check it out. One of the funnest movies I've done in a long time. Right, nice. Man. And <laughs> where can, how about those actors, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> where, where can people Beast find Tal, you? I know you're not Jane big Powell on. I know you're not. Wow. I know you're not big on social, but where can people find you? I'm promising myself to do more. I'm going to do some Beast Mode promoting, and mm. for the pilot that I just finished for nothing, uh, that's coming out hopefully soon, and hopefully we get picked up. Fingers crossed. But you can find me at Real James Duval on. Twitter or uh, Instagram, uh -huh. and that's uh, R E A L J A M E S D V A L one O. I promise I'll get some good treats up for everybody. Once in a while, I drop some some juicy nuggets, and I just haven't in a little while, nice. so I promise to. I'll be sure well, to go follow you. Yeah, I, I think I, I believe I follow you already. I, I will I will double check, but I, I'm pretty sure I follow you. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll check too because I know like and it's it's so. 
one last thing if it's okay to plug on the Wait, show all my fans on there who've left me messages i literally have like over i don't know 100 and something messages on and i've not checked them because <laughs> when i looked i was like oh, intimidated I can't, I can't i just shut down i couldn't do it Fair. and now starting two days ago i've started re returning five or ten a day mm. <laughs> and I'm glad I did because some people were like, thank you for getting back. And I'm like, God, I feel like such a heel, like an ass. <sighs> but it's nothing, it's nothing personal. I'm just not, I've not been so proficient at it. Sure. So I'm working. Mm -hmm. I'm working. It must be hard so, to keep up. I get it. Yeah. And so guys, if he has a gun back to you, it's fine. He's going to get to you. It's a, it's I okay. promise you, I will. <laughs> Even if it takes a little bit. And, and yes, I there promise. And there will always be something. I'll always try to drop something kind of cool at least once in a while. And we've got you on record um, now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, it's been a while. So, like, David J. We were talking about Bauhaus and David J. and Kevin Haskins earlier. I'd actually done a live play with David J. Oh, cool. that was supposed to tour. It didn't do much past. We went and did a show in 2011 at the Red Cat Theater downtown Los Angeles. But it was basically... One woman show, although I play the father to Edie Sedgwick and the wounded healer who was also the narrator of the show, um, named Norik, who's a centaur of sorts. It's like Chiron backwards. Mm -hmm. He's the first centaur. So instead of the body of a man and the head of a horse, I'm a crippled body of a man in a wheelchair and the head of a horse. Oh. And I narrate the play through Edie Sedgwick and her time and Andy Warhol's... Uh, factory years mm -hmm. into her eventual death and demise into the underworld. Oh my gosh. And then Ooh. in that middle of this whole play, David J does a whole album called Silver for Gold that he plays in between pieces. That's, That's kind of cool. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's not totally gone. Hopefully we'll try to get that back out at some point mm -hmm. again. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I promise that I always have some kind of juicy nugget like that that I'll be dropping here and there. I'm, I've been a little bit selfish keeping it to myself. <laughs> I promise. I <laughs> well, definitely let Fair us enough. know because that I want to see. That I would totally it. go. Yeah, I'm super yeah, proud of that. And I'm super proud of so many things and I just don't share them because I'm not used to sharing them. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Well, we'd love to check that out. Yes. Well, Jimmy, bless you. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much so for much. joining us. James, Rusty, Ryan, Guys, thank you for thank everything. You, and thank you for uh, spending the time to talk to me and for checking Beast Mode out and giving us a plug. Absolutely. And uh, stay safe, everybody. Be good to yourselves and be good to each other. You too. Cheers, it's great talking to you. Thank you very much.